In the 16th century, a man with a gold hooped earring and a little goatee picked up a quill and wrote some of the finest sonnets the world has ever seen. Five hundred, y- six hundred, f- si- five hundred years later, a man with nothing better to do sits down with a microphone and tries to work out what the hell that bloke was going on about. Welcome to the final couplet. Hello again. Another week, another sonnet. Welcome back to the final couplet with me, Theo Cowan. I hope you've had a good week and the shops playing Christmas music in November isn't getting on your nerves. That's too early, isn't it? November. I tell you what, they wouldn't have been playing Christmas music in November in Shakespeare's time, that's for sure. When Shakespeare went into the butcher to get a a bit of lamb, he probably wasn't listening to Mariah Carey. You know what else wouldn't have existed? Black Friday. Maybe Black Death Friday, am I right? (laughs) Shouldn't laugh, of course, because lots of people lost their lives to the Black Death. So Um, we should probably move on, shouldn't we, to reading Sonnet 33. Of course, Sonnet 33 is famous for following Sonnet 32 in Shakespeare's long, 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 long list of sonnets. Let's just dive in and have a listen, shall we? Sonnet 33 Full many a glorious morning have I seen Flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye Kissing with golden face the meadows green Gilding pale streams with heavenly alchemy Anon permit the basest clouds to ride With ugly rack on his celestial face And from the forlorn world his visage hide Stealing unseen to west with this disgrace Even so my sun one early morn did shine With all triumphant splendour on my brow But out, alack, he was but one hour mine The region cloud hath masked him from me now. Yet him for this my love no whit disdaineth. Sons of the world may stain when heaven's sun staineth. Well, that is Sonnet 33. And I know, I know that on the face of it, it's just about the sun and about the clouds But let me tell you this, I think there's a hidden meaning. I don't think he was just talking about the sun and the clouds because Shakespeare was a very clever man, you see. And he didn't just write about nature and stuff. There was always another meaning. So I think that the hidden meaning is that the person that he's writing these sonnets for has pissed Shakespeare off a bit. All right. I don't know what he's done. Or she. Don't know what they've done, but they've annoyed him. Because he's saying, I think the overall sort of arc of the poem is he's saying, you know, the sun shines on me and it's lovely. And then this cloud comes along and ruins it a little bit. And that's just like my love, you know, shining on me, being all lovely. And then doing something that's a bit shitty. And then... I actually forgive him. It's fine. That is the arc of the story, I think. Uh, could be wrong. Could Of course could be wrong. But for me, that makes sense. I wonder what he did to piss Shakespeare off so much. What would annoy Shakespeare? Maybe telling him that he didn't really like Romeo and Juliet. Thought it wasn't that great. A bit boring. Maybe he thought Midsummer Night's Dream was a bit childish with the with Bottom and stuff like that. You know, don't call a character Bottom. That is really childish. Come on. Is that your sense of humour? I thought you were meant to be sophisticated. All of this conjecture, of course. 
There's no evidence to back this up, but I think I've got a very strong case here. Right, let's break this bad boy down line by line, shall we? So we start with, Full many a glorious morning have I seen flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye. I was going to say that these first few lines, they, it does what it says on the tin. But of course, that's an English phrase and North American listeners won't know what I'm talking about. Of course, for starters, you call tin a can. So you're already like, what, what the hell's a tin? But basically, you got a tin of paint or something like that, and it's got the instructions on the back. And that's just simple. It's easy. It does what it says on the tin. So for this, I quite like using it maybe with Shakespeare, is these first few lines does what it says on the tin. Simple. doesn't have any depth to it, just straightforward. So really it just means I've seen a load of lovely mornings where the sun has made the mountains look lovely, beautiful. Then he continues in the same vein. Kissing with golden face the meadows green, gilding pale streams with heavenly alchemy. So the sun is just kissing those those meadows, you know, when the when the grass is all wet and the sun sort of glistens on it. That's nice, isn't it? And and same with the stream, you know, when the sun hits a, a stream and it shimmers. It's all very lovely scene that he's setting up here that he's painting for us. But and there's a but. It's not technically a but, but I like to think of it as a but. He continues with Anon permit the basest clouds to ride with ugly rack on his celestial face. Which means, but then comes along these horrible old clouds that ride across the sun's face. And from the forlorn world his visage hide, stealing unseen to west with this disgrace. So the sun has sort of allowed these clouds to, to cover his face and and it hides him from the forlorn world and, and, and then the sun sort of sneaks off to the west in disgrace. So all that lovely image that he's conjured up there is, is now ruined really by these clouds that have covered the sun and, and, and then the sun sort of slunk off. Now he continues with, Even so my sun one early morn did shine with all triumphant splendour on my brow. So you may notice that I'm emphasising my. So I'm saying, even so my sun. And I think here he's meaning my sun as lover. So my lover is just like the sun I was chatting about earlier in the sonnet. So my lover shines on me and, and, and he's lovely and beautiful and, and triumphant splendor on my, my brow. But out alack, he was but one hour mine. The region cloud hath masked him from me now. So he's saying that beautiful moment of splendor with his lover only lasted an hour. And then the cloud came across and and masked him from Shakespeare. And I'm seeing this as a bit of a, you know, he's lovely for a bit, and then he's a bit of an asshole, And then he's nice again, and then he's a bit of an asshole. Just like, you know, the sun is lovely, and then it gets covered by clouds, and then it, and then it appears again, and then it gets covered again. So, I'm, I, d I don't know. I mean, like, we can't expect everyone to be lovely all the time, I guess. But, it does sound like he's very up and down, doesn't it? Shakespeare's lover here. It sounds like he's a bit temperamental. And now we're on to the final couplet. Yet him for this my love no whit disdaineth. Sons of the world may stain when heaven's sun staineth. And here he's saying, you know, he can be a bit of an asshole, but I don't, I don't, hold it against him it's fine i don't i don't worry about it because lovely golden shining men like like him can really just disgrace themselves all they want you know just like the sun does the actual sun and it's not really a problem i don't mind it so shakespeare sort of forgives him for 
for these mood swings. I mean, to be honest, Shakespeare can't have been the easiest guy to live with, could he, really? So it's maybe nice that he's putting this in a poem saying, look, I forgive you for your faults, so please forgive me for mine. But also, this this recipient of the poem could be a bit of an arsehole. And he could be horrible to Shakespeare, so it's a tough one. You know, why does he love him so much if he's if he's all sunny one minute and then he's being an idiot the next? All good questions to be asking ourselves, I think. And I think this is the first time that Shakespeare's sort of been critical of the recipient of the poem. I think. Please tell me if 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 you can remember any other occasions where he's been critical of, of the recipient, but I think this is the first time. So it's quite nice that it's sort of developed into, I mean, it feels like it's more of a relationship now. In the previous ones, he's sort of courting this this lover and saying how amazing the the lover is. And now he's he's sort of maybe a few months into the relationship and he's going, oh, actually, they're a bit annoying sometimes. Right. I think it's time to put... Sonnet 33 to our story. If you're joining the podcast for the first time and you're thinking, what's the story? Well, every week I make up a story around the sonnet and it's sort of an ongoing story, but I can fill you in briefly as to as to what happened previously. So Shakespeare has been sending a load of sonnets to this mysterious shadowy figure And he's been attaching these sonnets to his cat that he's found called Percutio. And Percutio has been sort of, you know, running back and forth with these sonnets, delivering them. And Shakespeare's really fallen in love with the idea of this shadowy figure. Now, the shadowy figure has come up with a plan to send an ugly person in place of him to Shakespeare, to meet him, to test Shakespeare to see if Shakespeare will still fall in love with the ugly person, even though they're ugly. And if Shakespeare does still fall in love with the ugly person, then the shadowy figure will reveal themselves and go, oh, I knew you were the right person for me, because looks don't mean a thing to you. Now, I wonder if this is going to backfire. It's a bit of a weird plan. It would definitely be a weird thing to do on Tinder, wouldn't it? Now, where we left off was uh, Shakespeare had just delivered Sonnet 32 to who he thinks is the shadowy figure, but is actually just an ugly bloke who the shadowy figure sent in place of him to test Shakespeare. Let's see where the story takes us next. Shakespeare finished reading Sonnet 32 to the ugly old bloke. The bloke said, oh, okay, yeah, that was nice, thanks. And Shakespeare said, you're not quite how I imagined you, but there's something beautiful about your soul. And the old man said, well, no one's ever said that to me. I don't think there's nothing beautiful in my soul, that's for sure. And Shakespeare said, oh, no, but there is, there is, there's a... There's a softness within you uh, that 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 overrides your 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 tough, uh, rough exterior. Right then, okay. Bit weird. And Shakespeare says, "May I? May I? May I kiss you?" And the old man says, "Oh no, that'll cost you more. That will." And Shakespeare says, "What do you mean, cost me?" And the old man says, he, he didn't say nothing about kissing. He didn't say nothing about kissing. I'm not doing that. And Shakespeare said, what do you mean he? What are you talking about? And the old man said, listen, I was paid for a job and I've done the job and I ain't going to kiss no one. All right. And Shakespeare said, I, I, I don't understand. And the old man said, listen, I've got a partner at home. Yeah. And I love him very much and he loves me. And that's the end of it. I'm not. I'm not going to kiss no one. I don't want to kiss. And Shakespeare said, well, but what about the letters we've been exchanging? They, they've they been beautiful and heartfelt. I, I thought you felt something towards me. 
And the old man said, well, it's got nothing to do with me. I just got paid to come here to the graveyard and say hello to some bloke. Suddenly, from behind a gravestone, the shadowy figure revealed themselves. And Shakespeare said, who are you? And the shadowy figure took down their hood that they were wearing for some reason and said, tis I, the shadowy figure. And Shakespeare said, but, 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 but who's that? And the shadowy figure said, let me explain. And Shakespeare said, yes, I think you should bloody explain. What the hell's going on? Listen, I sent this ugly old man. Sorry, no offence. None taken, that's fine. I I know I'm, I'm not the best looking bloke. Yes. Anyway, I sent this ugly old man in place of me to test you to see if you really did love me, no matter what. And it turns out you do. And Shakespeare said, that's a rotten old trick. I don't appreciate that at all. And the shadowy figure said, well, I'm sorry, but I, I had to know. I had to know if you truly loved me. And Shakespeare said, who are you anyway? And the shadowy figure said, John Donne. And Shakespeare said, John Donne, the English poet, scholar, soldier and secretary born into a recusant family who later became a cleric in the Church of England. Born on the 22nd of January, 1572. And John Donne said, "'Tis I.' And Shakespeare said, "'Well, John Donne, you are gorgeous, "'but you can shove your poems up your ass "'because the trick you've played on me "'has made me one of the saddest men "'there ever has been.' And Shakespeare ran off into the night, leaving John Donne in the graveyard with the ugly old man. Shakespeare went to the only place he knew he would find solace, the nag's head. He burst into the nag's head in tears. And who was there? Ben Johnson. And Ben Johnson said, Shakespeare, what's up? And Shakespeare said, I'm I'm so upset. I, I've been tricked. I've been tricked. Ben Johnson orders Shakespeare a pint of mead as Shakespeare explains the whole story of the shadowy figure. Ben Johnson says, when I get my hands on that John Donne, I'm going to do some horrible things to him. And Shakespeare said, but I still love him. I still love him, even after he's been so cruel. And Ben Johnson said, well, Shakespeare, there's only one thing for it. You have to write a sonnet to explain to him exactly how you feel. And please don't hold any punches, Shakespeare. I know you like to flower things up, but this time, just tell it how it is. And Shakespeare says, you're right. I shall write a sonnet for him now. Do you have a quill? And Ben Johnson says, I do, but it's kind of my special quill. Um, do you not have your quill? And Shakespeare says, I actually forgot it at home. It's kind of kind of annoying. And ben Johnson says, well... I don't know if you sort of write with my quill, it gets a bit complicated and and it's sort of, that's sort of my quill. It's got a special feather on it. And Shakespeare says, oh, just give me the quill. What are you, what are you doing? Ben Johnson says, no, seriously, I I just, I feel a bit uncomfortable lending you my quill because it's sort of the power of my writing is, is sort of linked to the quill. So you might sort of steal some of my ideas. And Shakespeare said, just give me the bloody quill. Ben Johnson reluctantly handed over the quill to Shakespeare and Shakespeare frantically scribbled down a sonnet in which to read to John Donne. Eventually, Shakespeare said, I've finished, I've finished. And Ben Johnson put down his 11th pint of mead and said, well, read it to me then, Shakespeare, and I'll tell you if it's any good. And Shakespeare said, OK, I shall. Sonnet 33. I've seen loads of lovely mornings where the sun makes the mountains look beautiful, kissed the green meadows with his golden face, and made streams shine with heavenly magic. But then these horrible old clouds drift by and hide the sun from the sad world, sneaking off to the west in disgrace. In the same way, my son, a.k.a. you, shone on my face with triumphant splendour. But he was only mine for an hour. The clouds have hidden him from me now. 
but I don't hold it against him for this. Beautiful, golden men like him can disgrace themselves as much as the actual son. Well, this story is twisting and turning all over the place. I don't know what's going to happen next. Quite literally. A hell of a lot of writers are entering the fray now though, aren't they? Got Ben Johnson, you got John Donne, you got William Shakespeare, who's next? John Donne being the shadowy figure, I bet you didn't see that one coming. Anyway, that's it for this week. See you next week. Bye!